Provost, uh, Dean Barbara Khan, President Donna Shalala, you've put together an excellent day and a half for all of us to think deeply about issues, and I want to thank you very much for including me in part of your deliberations here. Um, I agree with the sentiment that President Shalala expressed this morning, which is this is a unusual time for the global economy. Instead of going all the way to Davos to discuss these matters, why don't we come to warm Miami so that our neurons can move more smoothly? And Tom, uh, thank you for reminding everybody that, you know, please turn your mobile phones off. As far as I'm concerned, please keep them on. Talk as much as you'd like, because frankly, we need revenue. <laughs> now, it's very hard to be a lunchtime speaker because either, you know, people will remind you there's no such thing as a free lunch or your menu or your at lunch. I mean, it's very difficult. So I'm going to dive right into it. As I thought about what it is that I wanted to talk to you about today, I, I'm going to try and press the envelope just a little bit for all of you. I mean, frankly, you know, 30 some years ago, I was a student at Berkeley, and I was like many of you uh, sitting in this room. And what has happened to me in the last 30 years is I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world and doing business all over the world. And I have to tell you, I feel very, very privileged and humbled at the same time that I've had that opportunity. And so after 30 years of global international business in virtually every country and every culture, what can I tell you about the world? And that's what I'm going to try and do so that you are sort of kind of the beneficiary of all the air miles that I've collected over the last three decades. So the first thing I'd say to you is that the world is changing. And I'm sure you've heard it before and all of that, but take it from me that it is changing in a very profound way. And we here in the United States, I think, have to pay slightly special attention because over the last 50 or 60 years since World War II, we have been the dominant player and we've become kind of the unilateral um, power in the world after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The world is getting ready to change. If you think about where wealth is being created today, wealth is being created in China, in India, in Russia, in Latin America, in the Middle East. Emerging markets now produce 80% of the incremental GDP being produced in the world. Developed markets only produce 20%. Now you might say, well, Arun, uh, this is all pretty good, fine, but we've got a recession going on now, and when, when we come out of the recession, things will be different. And I would say, not at all. The recession is simply a speed bump. What is going on in these economies of China and India and the BRIC countries and the Middle East is something profound that is going to last 10, 20, 30 years, now, this, the point here is not to kind of scare people, and I'm going to come on to kind of, therefore, what do we need to do? But the point is that there is a profound change occurring, and we just need to think of the world and the globe as our marketplace, not the 50 states of America, which we did for a long period of time. We produced a lot, and we were able to sell most of our things here in America, and then we started going overseas, and we liked pockets and so on, but now we really, really have to embrace the rest of the world for the source of markets, for supply chain, for goods, for services, for a whole bunch of things. The second thing I would say is that the world is very interconnected. And if you heard Peter Drucker this morning, he talk, talked about how their planes fly and how their supply chain management works and if you think about what has happened in the world in the last 10 years is that you've got communications everywhere. You've got wireless communications in the last mile. You've got broad pipes, fiber optics communications that are carrying broadband and everything else. You can sit here today and do Skype with your cousin in Australia 
I mean, things that we didn't think of five or ten years ago are completely possible today. So it is not only the physical infrastructure, but also the intellectual and software infrastructure that has been built in the last ten years that makes the world a highly connected place. And of course, we can barely think about today's financial crisis without knowing that actually it sort of kind of started off with housing and packaging and CDOs and CDSs and, and then some New York banks bought it and then some London banks bought it and some Swiss banks bought it and some Chinese banks bought it and before you know the whole world has a contagion of the housing issues that we have around the world. If you traveled the world even just six months ago and you went to Dubai or India, or China, people would say, you know, this problem that you guys are having is uniquely American. Our banks are very safe, and everything is just fine here. Not true. We are inextricably mixed today because of the infrastructure, because of um, all the other things that have been built up, and because of the way world trade occurs today. Ten years ago, when there was an Asian crisis or the Russian crisis, actually the world didn't feel it. So one of the points here is that the change that's occurred in the last ten years is a very rapid change, and my view is actually that the world is going to become even more interdependent. Sure, we'll have our differences and discussions and debates around Doha and all of that, but at the end of the day, we are now so interconnected, Latin America into America, America into Europe, America into the rest of the world. And frankly, one of the best defenses that we have to make sure that our standard of living and our GDP continues to grow is to actually lead this parade rather than shy away from it. More and more, you're going to be hearing, instead of G7 and G8, eight, eight country here is Russia, more the G20. So you include South Africa, you include Brazil, you include India, you include a number of other countries. And we are going to have to rewire our institutions so that we are now more inclusive in a G20 sense. So when there is a crisis, um, everybody is doing something about it. So it's not just the U.S. economy and the Treasury and the Fed throwing down a trillion dollars, but it's the Brits throwing down a hundred million, a hundred billion pounds, or the Germans putting down a hundred billion euros, or the Indians or the Chinese putting their own stimulus in place. So how we actually solve world problems, and you can take climate change, you can take any issue, staying on the financial issue for just a moment, we're all going to have to have coordinated action because we are an interconnected society. I'll make one last point about just the political, social, economic. As much as, you know, we sit here and we talk about China, or we talk about India, or we talk about America, or Latin America, or Europe, the words come more easily than the true understanding of any one of these economies. One of the complexities here is that actually, you know, we think about our society, how we are wired politically, how we are wired economically, how we are wired socially. The way these other countries are wired is quite different. China is wired very differently. India is wired very differently. Even some of our closest allies, you know, the Germans, uh, the Brits, the French, the Italians, the Spaniards, their societies are actually wired differently. So for one to have a genuine understanding of kind of how the cookie crumbles in these societies takes a real effort to kind of dive deep and see what turns these societies on, how they organize politically, economically, socially, so that when you go in as a business person or as a business leader, you're able to say, aha, these are the differences, and therefore our products are going to have to be that different so that we can actually appreciate what it is they're trying to do. Because in any business, you're always trying to find win-win solutions. You're trying to find how can I help you live your life better. But just taking a product from here and throwing it across the world isn't going to be good enough. So my, the net for me of all of this is 
that the United States is still the most powerful country in the world by a lot and has a very large economy. One fourth of the global economy is here in the United States. But this is an endowment that we have. You know, when you look forward 10, 20, 30 years, the question is, will our children and their children have a life as good as the life that we've led in the last 20, 40, 60 years? That's the question. The question is not, you know, is the world falling today? We can certainly kind of get by. But getting by is not going to be enough. We are going to have to make sure that we embrace the world, we embrace other cultures, we are front foot about this, and that we think of the world as our marketplace. Let me move the subject on to innovation. Because in my mind, if we want to have global excellence for the next 20, 30, 40 years, we have to innovate. We have to innovate in everything. Now just think about virtually any industry. I found it interesting uh, this morning when Alberta was speaking about the media industry, you know, radio and television and newspapers and how newspapers have been disintermediated and how we all get our news today. Uh, we all read our newspapers, but we also do Google News. We also do Yahoo News. So we are, every industry is changing dramatically. And I think about the industry that I've been part of for the last 25 years, the communications industry. 25 years ago, it was landline phones. Then we got, got on to mobile phones. Then we got on to Blackberries and email and all of that. And now we do Facebook and instant messaging and all of that on our mobile devices all the time. So customer needs in virtually every industry are going to change. Technology. Frankly, one of the scarier things here is that the pace of technology is moving very fast. Whether it's the internet, whether it's wireless communications, whether it's genetics, whether whatever field of study you're interested in, technology is moving very fast. And the key is going to be, you know, we hope that we continue to produce products that are relevant and useful for human beings. Human beings change slightly slower than technologists would have us believe. And if you talk to the people at the cutting edge of science, they all think, you know, we'll be happy to take our DNA tests, and before I get married, I'll show my prospective uh, spouse what my DNA looks like so we can all kind of look at our offsprings and everything will be fantastic and so on and so forth. Mo you know, that's not how human beings live. Right? I I'm sure here in Miami, you certainly don't live that way. <laughs> but the point here is there is a lot of science and technology being thrown at us as consumers. You know, even being in the industry, I some sometimes find it hard to just keep up with all the gadget gadgets that are coming on these days. You know, from the iPhones to the netbooks to this, to BlackBerry to this, nah, nah, nah. And believe me, they're not going to stop coming. More is coming your way. And as a, as a consumer, you literally have to kind of say, you know, what is it that I need? I want email. I want social networking. I want this. I want that. So this is the device that I'm going to take. But technology is changing things rapidly. Think about the auto industry where hybrids and, and electric cars cars are going to have to become much more important elements, otherwise we are not going to be able to solve our energy problem, which is a big problem that we need to solve. And we have a little bit of a respite here with oil prices down to 40 bucks, but we need to solve this problem. Think about competition. Uh, I think, Peter, it was you who was talking about, you know, competition coming at us from everywhere. Well, you've got the internet. You've got Google. You've got Yahoo. You've got advertisers who are building products all over the world with one click being able to show their wares using a keyword anywhere in the world. You have no idea where the plant is or what the product is. Next thing you know, you've ordered it, and, and Peter in one of his big jumbos is kind of delivering it to your doorstep. Right? So stuff is happening. Globalization is happening. Uh, competition is going to come from everywhere. And finally, given what has happened in the last 12 months uh, around the world, Regulation will increase. I mean, the venerated investment banks of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley are mere commercial banks today. Right? 
No more 40 to 1 leverage ratios, you know, back down to 10 to 1. No more fancy CDS syndications, triple backed um, insurance products, etc. No, no. We, we, the, the problem here is we didn't understand what was on our balance sheet. We didn't understand what was the derivative aspect of all of this. So there'll be more regulation, unfortunately. Because frankly, in life, we need less regulation. But when bad things happen, and there were obviously people who let bad things occur, then we will, for a period of time, have more regulation. I find it somewhat ironic that the US government is the majority holder in many of our banks. It's, it's true here, it's true in Britain, it's true all around the world. And banking was supposed to be sort of the kind of free enterprise, credit flows and all of that. So the world is changing, and the thing that we have to do is make sure that the products and services that we are producing stay very innovative. And the thing is, innovation, unlike if you go back 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago and say, where did most of the innovation come from? Most of the innovation came from the United States and most of the innovation came from Europe. A little bit of innovation came from Japan in the last 40 years. That's where all the scientists were. That's where kind of the resources were. That's where the triangulation of what you have here at the university between science and business and finance comes together. It was all here in the United States and in Europe. Now if you fast forward 10, 20 years, China is producing a half a million engineers a year. India produces 250,000 engineers a year. The United States produces 75,000 engineers a year. So if you just think of in one technology terms, there's obviously lots of bright people studying engineering and all of that. They'll have to do something with themselves. They'll be innovative. And necessity is the mother of invention. And so we should just be prepared that innovation happens everywhere, but to capture and harness the innovation early in its life cycle for the best possible advantage. The second thing I'd say about innovation is, if you think of a highly developed country versus an emerging market, and we experienced this when we took our technology uh, to India. We bought a company in India two years ago, took our best technology there, and before we knew, the Indians were kind of messing around with our technology, creating it to be even better, and sending it right back to us. The reason for that is when you think about innovation in a highly developed society, take a product that we have, it's called M-Pesa, which is around money transfer. If I tried to introduce that service here in the United States, We'd be hauled to the Federal Reserve by all the banks who say, you know, these guys are trying to get into the banking business. Don't let them get into the banking business. If they are mobile carriers. They should stay in the mobile business. We go to Kenya. We say to the Kenyan government, you know, you don't have bank branches in a lot of rural areas. Would you like us, because you've got coverage everywhere, wouldn't you like us to kind of do this? They go, absolutely, go right ahead. And people send money, and you can retrieve your money you send it to a family member in a village, they go to a Vodafone shop, which is just a little kiosk in a corner, and they collect their money. So we are, yes, we are in the banking business. But we would not be permitted to be in that business here in the United States, but we can do it in Kenya and India and Afghanistan and a bunch of other places, right? So because there are legacy interests, you always have to think about all of that before innovation occurs. So for example, if we were saying, let's do some really interesting HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. You'd, here you'd have to think about the existing stock that you have and how you might be able to innovate. If you were building new HVAC systems in Dubai, the buildings are going up now. So you can put in whatever it is you want to put in. So the pace of innovation shouldn't surprise us that much of this innovation will actually go overseas first, get turned around, and then come back here. This is not to say that there won't be innovation here. It's just it is easier to innovate where there aren't legacy systems. For me, there are certain industries, there are certain things that we have to do well, we have to own at a global level. Um, clean energy, climate change, all the technology that goes with that is something that we have the capability of being the best in the world at. Healthcare. Clearly you heard the President talk about it this morning. 
we need to kind of revamp our healthcare system. Um, in terms of computing, communications, entertainment, we are the world leader. You know, you don't get companies like Apple uh, yet coming out of China or India. Apple is Apple. Some might say Steve Jobs is Apple. And he is, right? But the front end innovation is all happening here in the United States. Educating leaders of tomorrow is a complete competitive advantage that the United States has and a university like University of Miami has. So innovation is going to be absolutely key for our success in the future. I, I want to bring up a question around personal leadership because my own view is that the government has an important role to provide basic infrastructure so that people succeed. But at the end of the day, it is about human personal ingenuity. And one of the things that I've learned and I've watched over the years, people who are successful have do three things very well. One is called strategic leadership. Second is operational leadership. And the third is people leadership. Strategic leadership is about whatever industry you're in, make sure that you understand the forces that are acting on that industry and what's going to make your company within that industry successful. Techno technological changes, competitive changes, customer changes, uh, regulator regulatory changes, whatever changes are occurring, globalization changes. Really have a keen view as to how your industry is going to change. You can think about the education business. How's the education business changing? And therefore, what do you need to do five, ten years from now to make sure that you are the best educators in the world? Having that ability is tremendously important in leaders. The second is operational leadership. Operational leadership is basically about taking the wash out every day. You know, in, in, Jim, in, in Peter's case, it would be making sure that, you know, the, the delivery of the packages are, are, are getting there. In a wireless business, it would be about making sure that you don't have drop calls and, 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 and calls that you can't complete. Um, whatever it is, keeping your customers happy, making sure your employees are engaged, uh, all of those things are operational leadership issues. You need to be able to produce the financials on quarter, on quarter basis so that the public markets have the trust in you to continue to own your stock. The final part is people leadership. I haven't met any great leader who was unable to connect with people. At the end of the day, we're all managing people and trying to get people to do things that are bigger than they thought were possible. That's the role of management and that's the role of leadership, which is you're getting people to perform at a higher level than even the person thought possible. So you, you have to be able to do these three things simultaneously. Be a great strategic leader, be a great operational leader, be a great people leader, simultaneously in a global environment. So there are lots of ands here, strategic and operational and people and global. And my view is that actually the next generation of leaders in some ways will be better than the generation of leaders that have gone in the past simply because we keep doing the and, 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 and bit. Now, the reason I mention this is I, I see a lot of kind of young people uh, in the audience here. This is something that you need to start thinking about early, very early, because, you know, to, to, to become really good with people, you might say, well, I'm sort of a shy kind of a person. I'm not sure if I'm really good. Well, if you try, if you practice, you will get good. This is not about kind of, you know, some people are just genuinely good with people and other people are genuinely not so good with people and the two shall never meet. I don't buy that. What I do buy is that if you practice, you can be a better leader with people. If you practice, you can be a better strategic leader. And so start practicing early because the challenge of leadership is going to be that much bigger and greater in the years ahead. Now, I have a little piece here on wireless. I'm going to skip that because I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have about wireless and what's going on in the wireless world. But 
more from a broad, big picture perspective, I wanted you to take away, one, the world is changing. Two, you have to understand your industry globally. Three, you must innovate in whatever it is you're doing. And finally, lead. Be front foot. Be kind of be out there. Have the personal leadership ambitions so that you can be a leader in the future. Thank you very much.